You are listening to a Sunday morning message from River Corner Church. River Corner Church is a growing church community of everyday people who gather to worship God, follow Jesus, and journey through life together. You are invited to gather with us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. If you have any questions about something you heard in this message, or if you want to learn more about our growing church community, visit us online at rivercornerchurch.com. So today we're going to talk a little about the Lord's Prayer. And my opening question is, when we hear God described as Father, what comes to our minds? Um, Like when when Phil and Don are talking about having space to kind of reflect, you know, like when we have those moments of uh, when we just can clear our heads and think deeply about God, what comes to our heads? Like when we hear God described as Father, do we uh, feel safe? Do we have, have a sense of, we're okay with God as Father? Or do we feel afraid? Is it, does the concept of God as Father make us feel anxious? Or does it make us feel cared for and provided for? All these things kind of affect our relationship with the Lord. If, we're, we're, if we think that he's out to get us or his heart is closed to us, if we kind of think he's like our earthly father sometimes, there's sort of things in our hearts that kind of put a barrier between us and the Lord. But the good thing about Jesus is Jesus is teaching us who God really is. Anyways, he teaches that he's a good father who cares for us. So during the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches us what the father is actually like. This whole sermon's about it. Uh, From Matthew 5 to 7, it's about the heart of the father. But in particular, the Lord's Prayer and the couple of passages before that really describe who God is. And when we make space, when we, make those, those t- when we set time aside to hear God and to be with God, when we kind of quiet down, like we sang that Be Still and No song today, it's so true. We have to create space. And there's so much that goes on in our heads and, and what happens in our week and our day. You know, so-and-so cut me off in traffic. You know, the job's going bad. You know, the kids are screaming. You know, like, you know life, life is life. You know, life happens regardless if we're aware of it or not. You know, a lot of times we're hopefully aware of it, right? But life's going, life's moving. But at the, at the center of it all, there's a good father who loves us and cares for us. And we can go to him. And the whole point of Jesus is he's, he's making a way for us to come to the Father. That's his whole, his whole ministry. And he still does that. Um, so let's key in on this and kind of really dig into it today. My prayer is that we will get a, just to get a vision for what Jesus is saying and, and to see what he's seeing about the Father. Because our own conceptions of him really cloud uh, our ability to go to him. But Jesus makes a way even in this. So he, he teaches us who he's like. And there's a connection here with Matthew eleven twenty seven. This is sort of like a, a tie-on to the Lord's Prayer. And in, in the scripture, Jesus says um, that no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone who the Son chooses to reveal him. So Jesus has the ability to make God known. He has a special relationship, being God himself, being a part of the Trinity, and how that all works. I have no idea. I'm not God. I can't really explain it very well. But, he, but God is who he is. But Jesus knows the Father, and the Father knows Jesus. And Jesus invites us into this relationship that's safe and secure and that's, that's good. Because our natural inclination is to be alienated from God. But Jesus makes this known. So he's our guide to understand the Father. And I like that he says, like, in this scripture in Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone who the Son chooses to reveal him. And we happen to be anyone's, you know, so anybody kind of qualifies for this. So you qualify, I qualify, we're all anyone's, right? So it, you don't have to be this elite special force of spiritual people to have access to the Father because Jesus has made that for us. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's, let's go to Matthew 6. So Matthew 6 uh, Verse, verse 5. This is like the kind of the prelude to the Lord's Prayer. So Jesus says, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So there's kind of two truths to pull from this before we get into the Lord's Prayer. One, Jesus wants to reveal the Father to us. And two, we can come to the Father in our weakness and in our brokenness. 
we don't have to come to him, to God with all these prerequisites, all the boxes checked, uh, to have everything together. You know, like we like to exude to our, our culture likes to exude a sense of confidence and I have the world by the neck and I'm doing well and I'm on social media posting all this cool stuff or I'm describing my life and it's awesome. Everything's awesome all the time. You know, that's like what we want to project to the culture. But life doesn't really work that way. We're broken people, to, broken things happen to us. And we just, and it's just sometimes how life is. Like life is life, but God is good in the midst of life. And we don't have to go to God with all our stuff together. We go to God as we are. And Jesus contrasts this with the hypocrites. And hypocrites means, you know, is a, is a Greek word for actors. Uh, in ancient theater, masks were used to portray someone else. So someone would wear a mask and act like they're Caesar, or act like they're so-and-so or whatever. But the mask defined a hypocrite as an actor. So it's the actors that are, you know, shouting in the streets, like, I'm so holy, I'm so good, I got it all together. But it's just a mask. It's just, it's just a facade. Because inside, we're all the same. We're all hurting. We're all broken. And we all need Jesus. And we need access to the Father. Jesus is contrasting ritual performance, doing the right thing the right way, with coming to God sincerely without pretension. None of us are going to do things the right way all the time or, or, or have the right recipe to make God happy or whatever we, we think. We come to God as we are. We come to God broken. We come to God simply being uh, human. And he receives us like that. And that's the beautiful thing about God's heart. It's like anyone, who, whosoever can come and drink from, from him. Like that's something he says in Isaiah 55. It's like, whoever is thirsty, let him come and drink. It isn't something for those who have it all together. It's not about the facade of, of religious performance. It's about coming as you are, in your humanity, in your brokenness, in your weakness, and coming to the Father who has, who has something for us to receive. You know, right now, and there was a, there's a bunch of church scandals that have been happening lately. I don't know if anybody's been noticing, but I have for sure. And in particular, one of them has really hit close to home. It's like a bigger group that, um, you know, I've, I know and I've worked with in the past. And it came out this week that the leader was having, you know, stuff going on behind the scenes that wasn't good. And it isn't an indictment against the Lord, but we are, as people, very much given to, hey, I'll put on... I'll put on the mask, I'll put on the facade, I'll put on the thing that makes me look good. But inside, who knows what's happening? It's not for us to be paranoid of each other, that's what I'm saying, but it's like when things are exposed and when things are revealed, it's like we have to take stock of our hearts. Like, Lord, what's really going on in my heart? Because God sees through the mask. God sees through, through the performance. Like the Pharisees are all about the performance. They're all about dancing the right way, doing the right thing, shouting the right way, wearing the right religious robes, having their, their talits be super long, which was these fringes that they wear on their, on their prayer shawl, just to have this appearance of, I'm the super righteous, I have it all together, I'm great. And that was what they projected to the world. But behind the scenes, there was rottenness happening at the core of them, and God could see it. And he's not... You know, he's not like, oh, you idiots. He's just like, I can see the truth. I know who you are. You got to come to me as you are and you get healing. So when all these things are happening in the church globally, it's like there's, there's something in us that's sick. And there's something in us that doesn't want to go to God as we are and be exposed. We, we don't want to be honest. We don't want to let God touch those places in our hearts so these things fester. And they hurt other people. And that's got to stop. So we need reform in the church, not just in the Mennonite world, but just globally. The church needs Jesus. I don't know if we, we got the memo yet, but we can't be the church without the Messiah, you know what I mean? But we're out here trying to do it without him, and we're failing spectacularly. So we, we need the Holy Spirit, and we need to come back to the first things again. God is our Father. We need the Spirit to do the Christian life, because we can't do it without him. We're just wearing a mask and dancing around and looking religious, and, and we... We have to move beyond that. We need the realness of the Spirit. So the Pharisees' reward, Jesus says that you have your reward. Their reward was the attention they were getting already from people. You know, dancing in the streets, having the long robes, having the religious thing going on. Their reward was people's attention. But there wasn't a true reward. It's just they see you, but Jesus says, I can see really what's happening. And you're not who you project to be to the world. You're a hypocrite. You're an actor. So get your heart right. And that's what he's saying to them. We don't have to jump through hoops for God. God already, God already receives us. 
So in Isaiah 55, going back to that, this, Isaiah 55 is linked to Isaiah 54 and 53. Isaiah 53 is about the Messiah, about him coming and dying and being uh, you know, the atonement for Israel. Isaiah 55 is describing that, uh, that process of salvation. It says, come, to everyone, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters of life. He who has no money, buy and eat. So there's no conditions on God's salvation. Just come as you are, broken as a sinner, as, as, as smelly as you are, as dirty as you are, just come and receive the waters of life and be cleansed and changed. But it's the power of the Spirit that does this. So Matthew 6, 7, Jesus goes on and talks to another group of people. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So we have the the religious group who thinks they have all together, dancing on the streets, wearing the stuff, doing the thing. And there's another group with empty phrases. And empty phrases is Greek for having to do with, you know, it's more of a concept of magical words or trying to say the right stuff or to conjure the right thing. This is more of a pagan view. Jesus is addressing pagans and not just Jews anymore. So all the magic incantations and all the, the hoobly boobilies and all the blah blah blahs and all the horoscopes and all the stuff we rely on to try to get God to do what we want him to do, to manipulate him, doesn't really work on God because God can't be manipulated. God's God. And he's teaching that you know, we can't manipulate him. He's not, magic doesn't work on God. It's not like Harry Potter and you, you, you get your magic wand out and God gives you a cheeseburger. It's not how it works. You know, it's, he's God. So he's saying, like, all those empty words and phrases, they don't get you to that place. What gets you to that place, Jesus is saying, is me. I'm that place. And he already has provided that for us. So that's the setup to the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is kind of saying, okay, when you come to me, when you come to the Father, it isn't like this. It's not through performance. It's not through incantations and magic rituals and magic thinking and, and dancing the right way to make something happen. It's coming like this. So I'm going to read the Lord's Prayer. Jesus says in verse 9, pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So Jesus is giving us a way and a path to walk. It's almost a path of prayer. We don't have to always stick with it like it's the only way to pray. This isn't what Jesus is saying. But this is everything we kind of need for our day, our week, our moment of life is in this prayer because it encapsulates everything. And when, uh, when everyone was describing earlier about that place they could go, they kind of just be still and know, this prayer actually really helps that. Like when life's chaotic, when my mind's anxious about this, when I've had a bad day, when I want to get in the mornings, I just want to get with the Lord. Usually I pray this prayer because it kind of grounds me. It kind of sets my feet back on the earth again. I'm not in my head like, oh, I got to do this today at work, or if I don't do this at the house, the house is going to explode. You know what I mean? This is the normal stuff we, we think about, right? It gets your feet back on the earth again. Because uh, Jesus brings what's heavenly and brings it down to earth. That's what he does, as he's God in the flesh. So it just gets us planted, and it gets us in ground with reality. Um, a really good friend of mine said, uh, faith is living in God's reality. And I like that. It's actually my wife said that once. Um, my best friend, right? Um, so it's, but that's such a good point. It's like our perspective is so focused on just the day-to-day minutia. But Jesus gives us a, a deeper perspective. Like in throughout the minutia, God's present. He isn't checked out. He hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't forgotten us. He's with us. And we have to almost just get down and get with him because he's already there and we're just not. We're, we're checked out mentally, we're checked out emotionally, but he's always there. He's always present. And the Lord's Prayer is kind of this on-ramp, this way to just get situated in the reality of who God is because that's the kingdom of God. So it's a prayer for disciples. So it, this is for us, it's for, it's for Everyone here, like you don't have to perform, you don't have to be qualified, you can just enter into this and do it. But the first stanza, we'll go through each stanza and kind of look at some stuff. But the first stanza is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And point one, Jesus is inviting us into the relationship he has with the Father. 
God is called our Father. The relationship is established first. So before you know, we, we acknowledge that he's king of the universe, that he's holy, that he's all these things that we're not, Jesus wants us to come to him first as, as, as our Father. And it's not just my Father, it's our Father. All of us together, this is our Father. And the prior images we have that come between us and God, you know, if we, we, when we hear the word Father and it makes us anxious or it makes us afraid or it makes us feel ashamed, all those things don't exist in God. He's not ashamed of us. He's not angry at us. He wants us to come to him with an open heart and be changed. He's already forgiven us. So the first stanza is our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. It's like come to him as a father, just like a child would go to their father. And we'll say it's a good father, so it's not a bad father here in this example, but the, father can go to, the child can go to the father and ask for whatever, and if, if it's a reasonable request, the father will give it. Jesus you know, compares, you know, if, you, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, won't God do the same for you? Like if, if your child asks for bread, are you going to give him a, a snake? You know, who, who does that? You know, a psychopath would do that. Like the kid's like, hey, can I have a cookie? And the dad drops a scorpion in his hand. You know, like who does that? So Jesus is kind of, in that, in that other parable, he's describing the same concept. Like God's not going to drop a scorpion in our laps and we're asking, hey, God, can I have a job that provides for my family? God, can I have this or this? He's like, he's a good father. Like he gives good gifts to his children. It's not in his nature just, okay, here's a scorpion, you know, have fun, you know. That's not what he does. We kind of have this in our heads that God's like this, but that punitive God is the God of, the Greek, of Greek mythology. He's the God that's out to just smite us, just knock us down, hurt us. The God of the Bible is a, is a protective father whose love changes us, who transforms us and redeems us. And when God's wrath is, is put out there, it's not because he delights in hurting people, it's to destroy things that destroy his people. It's to come against things that war against his, his body and things that war against our hearts. So the wrath of God is something that he delights in. It's something that it's like a purifying fire that has to go out sometimes to burn away all the stuff around the tree. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's the first stanza. It's entering into this relationship of God as our Father. Point two, it's God is holy. Hallowed be your name has to do with the holiness of God. Now, in our culture, we think of holy, we think of someone who's morally perfect. You know, we think of, like, someone that doesn't do anything wrong, they're always doing what's right, you know, they're untouchable. The biblical idea is, is more so, it's otherness. God is other than everything else. Like, we're all made of stuff. Like, we're all here because God decided we should exist. <laughs> but no one decided that God should exist. God just is. So he's completely other than anything else. There's nothing else like him. There's nothing else that can describe him, that could compare him to. He is who he is, because he is. And so the biblical idea of that is that God is this transcendent beauty that just captivates us, because he's the most beautiful thing in, in, the, in the universe, as well as being the most powerful thing. You know, he, he's not a thing, he's a person, but you, you, know, you know what I'm saying. But that's the biblical idea. So in the Lord's Prayer, we acknowledge that God, you're our Father in heaven, but hallowed be your name, because you are other than us. And the biblical idea of a name, a name wasn't just like, my name's Kevin, and it means something in, in Irish or whatever. But and a person's name in the Bible has to do with who they are. It kind of encapsulates who they are as a person. So hallowed be your name is like, God, you are other than, you are, you are above all, you are who you are. And I have to just sit in the mystery and acknowledge that that's true, and, and thank you for that. That's what he's saying. Hallowed be your name. Um, and we incorporate this into our lives by coming to God vulnerable and raw, by coming to God as we are. We slow down and make space to tell our Father our needs and wants because he, he wants to, to listen to us. He's not too busy for us, and the Lord's Prayer grounds us in this idea that he's a Father who listens to his children. Does that make sense? Okay. In the second stanza, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the first point, God the Father is also king. So this is something that Jesus tries to communicate. Like he establishes he's our father, he's other than, but he's also a king who has a kingdom. And the kingdom of God is a concept. Like it, there's a Greek word basileia, which means kingdom in, in, in the New Testament. And that has to do with God's rule and God's dominion. So it's where God 
sits, where God rules over, but it's also God's direct rule in people's lives and people's situations and people's hearts. That's the kingdom of God. It's like the chaos, the, the destruction, all that stuff around, the kingdom of God brings that into order, into alignment with the good father again. That's what the kingdom of God is about. So when Jesus casts out demons in the gospels, when he heals the sick, it, he says the kingdom of God has now come among you because it's a sign that, that all this disorder, all this chaos is being driven back by the power of God. Now how that looks in our lives, you know, it, it, it varies. But as a principle, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. It's, even if, it's, if he's not even healing our bodies, so to speak, he's healing our spirits, he's healing our minds, he's, he's doing things to bring us back into redemption, to bring us back into alignment of what things are supposed to be. Now in this life, it's always going to be a mixed bag of the kingdom's coming, but it's not here all the way yet. We're in the middle of these things. So sickness and death and suffering happen. And we always don't have the words to express it or even to understand it. So it doesn't minimize those things. But the cross is big enough to carry all of those burdens. And God's big enough to carry all the weight of all of our, all of our suffering, all of our brokenness. Um, that's what he does. So he heals, but he also carries. He also covers. And sometimes he has to drag us because we can't carry ourselves anymore. Life gets so hard. Life gets so broken. that It's God who puts us on, our, on his back and walks us through life sometimes. And he's the God that does that. His kingdom also is a part of that too. So if we're going through hard things, the kingdom isn't away from us. It's, he's present with us. He's with us. So Jesus is also establishing that when we pray for the kingdom to come, it's allowing God's rule to extend, himself, to extend itself into our lives. Um, that's one of the primary things about that. Um, and it's also the kingdom of God. Jesus is also making a point here that it's countercultural. And in our culture, we have a built-in system of values. We have a built-in system of what we want, what we desire, what we think is right. The kingdom of God is pretty much the opposite of that. Now, Don Crable has a book called The Upside-Down Kingdom. And we've got to think of it like that. It's very much flipped upside down. The powerful are the weakest. You know, the, the greatest is the servant. You know, God himself died and, and was brutally murdered by those he loved. So everything, when we think of the powerful, we think of those who have everything together. We think of that big shot on the chair, having the world at their fingertips, pushing the gold buttons and make the world work, right? That's what we think of as people. But Jesus is saying, my kingdom is not like this. The greatest is the servant. You know, what you think is, is good and what you value is opposite of my kingdom. Uh, and the Lord's Prayer reflects that. It's like, it's, it's a kingdom of a good father that cares for his children. It's, it's different than everything else. In the ancient world, like, Caesar is emperor. You know, or Caesar was Caesar. Like, you had no choice. If, you're, if Caesar was coming through your town, you had to get out of the way. You had to do whatever Caesar wanted you to do if he conquered you. But the kingdom of God doesn't come like that. It comes humble. It comes contrite. It comes with a crucified God. So it's completely different than all these other concepts. So in the Lord's Prayer, we enter into that. Like, it's, it isn't just, God, give me these magic words to have your kingdom come. And that's not what the Lord's Prayer is. The Lord's Prayer is entering into a reality of, God, you're other than, and your kingdom is good, and I want to see your kingdom worked out into my life. And Jesus compares the kingdom of God to, like, uh, yeast entering into a dough, and the dough rises, and it grows over time. Jesus always uses these organic metaphors for the kingdom of God. It's like, it's like seeds, and it's like earth, it's like trees, you know, it's like fruit, it's like mustard seeds. It's these things that work their way over time and just give life as they grow. So in the Lord's Prayer, we're praying that God, that you would do this in my life, my little broken, humble life, that you would bring your kingdom into it and make it grow and make it something beautiful and, it, and, and to reflect the Father. And that's what he does. Um, so we can pray and agree for the kingdom of God to come into our lives and to the world around us. As we would say here where we work, live and play, you know, it's, it's like the whole encompassing of life God's kingdom wants to come into. And we don't have to compartmentalize our lives, uh, compartmentalize our lives from the holy stuff with the secular stuff and all that. We all do that. And that's probably one reason why there's so much corruption in some parts of the church because, you know, the, the, the pastor, whoever, the figure, the leader, whatever, is like, okay, hey, the holy stuff I do here but what I do over here, that's kind of my business. You know, the kingdom of God, you stay out of that. I want to do what I want to do for this. And so it creates this unhealthy system where, you know, we're doing the holy stuff here, but in our, 
private lives, there's, that's not going on. So it's, the kingdom of God is about integrating all that together. It's like the kingdom of God fills every facet. It's like water that goes down into the, like water will go wherever, it, wherever the, the, the lowest point is. It has to do with gravity. God's kingdom goes like that. It's like it goes down to the lowest part of us and fills that up, just like water. And it gives life. So our, our prayer through this is that God, your kingdom would increase in us. That would fill all those empty holes. It would fill all those broken places and just give us life. Um, stanza three, give us this day our daily bread. So God, his father, uh, wants to provide for us and meet our needs. Um, bread was a staple of food in ancient Israel. It was uh, God making sure the essentials are met. Um, and it's also showing us that God wants to take care of us. So is, we have all this like, dramatic stuff, like our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. But then it, Jesus interjects this like, everyday need that we have. Like, Father, give us my daily bread. You know, bread was a staple of food in that time. It was everybody ate that, everybody ate fish, everybody ate bread, everybody ate all that stuff. But it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't seen as an obscene thing to ask God for. Like, God, I, I have these daily needs. Like, I need food, I need shelter, I need water. Can you meet these needs, God? And he's not uh, offended at that. He's like, of course I'll meet those daily needs. I'll, meet, I'll, I'll make sure you're okay. So there's, there's a safety in a sense that God wants to meet us where we're at and take care of us through this. He's not uh, moved from our pain. He's not, he doesn't, he, he, we're not invisible to him. He sees us. Stanza four. And forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. So it's, it's acknowledging that we have stuff in us that's broken. There's stuff in us that isn't right. And instead of hiding those things, because if we go to the Genesis story, when Adam and Eve sinned, they hid. They're like, let's go hide behind this bush. Let's go sow fig leaves. Let's cover up. Like, we're ashamed. Let's, let's run. Like, we can't trust the father anymore. You know, he's going to see my stuff. And they ran. But that's not what we're doing in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's like, just come as you are. Like when we're, conf- we're confessing our sins, it isn't like, hey, God hit me with the whip and flogged me up, you know, beat me up, God. That's not what it's saying. It's just saying, God, this stuff's in my heart. I struggle with this. I just need to come to you and tell you this. It's like off floating onto God. Does that make sense? It isn't punitive. It's, God, this is what's going on in me. Help me. Forgive me. You know, make me right. It isn't, it isn't punishing us. It's healing us. And so, in, in conjunction with this, we're forgiving those who have hurt us. Because this life is messy. This life is broken. You know, this life has a constant spiral of, of mess all over the place. You know, we're all messing up on each other. We're all just being these beings who are, are there's shades of God's glory in us, but there's also these broken parts that just kind of bleed out over everybody. And so, when we're, when we're asking the, the Lord to forgive us, we're also in turn forgiving those who have done that to us. Because if we hold on to unforgiveness and uh, resentment and bitterness, those things fester and they grow and, and they choke out any kind of life in us. Like if when we meet someone who's really uh, bitter and they really struggle with forgiveness, it's, it's, there's a closed wall there. And it's, there's not a lot of intimacy in relationships and in other things. And those things can can choke out the life of God that is growing in us. The kingdom of God will grow. It will flow down to the lowest place. We've got to let it in. And unforgiveness will always shut the door and try to keep it out. Does that make sense? And all of us are, are kind of moving on different levels through forgiveness because we've all been hurt. And God isn't angry at us. He's not ashamed of, at us. It's just like open up the gates and let forgiveness in. You know, it's, it's kind of a two-way thing. You know, open up that door, let his forgiveness hit us, but also when that door is open, forgiveness comes out from us, and it forgives those who have hurt us. And if we want to grow, if we want to get past certain places that we were stuck in, you know, when it comes to maturity, we have to let forgiveness come out of us. But in order to do that, we have to let the forgiveness of God come in. Does that make sense? So don't worry, we're not trying to, we're not trying to wear a mask and dance like a hypocrite. No, we're, we're letting the kingdom of God work into us. Um, and this is a practical thing <clears throat> when, we, when we're praying this like that's one thing that helps me when I actually pray this is like I know what's going on in my heart I know what I struggle with I know what my battles are I know what's going on around me I know how people have hurt me and this is, it's a really healing thing like when, when I feel that burden of, what, of my own mess coming to God and be like Father forgive me my debts as I've forgiven those indebted to us 
it, it liberates me and sets me, my feet back on the ground again so I can interact with God. Does that make sense? Because he automatically forgives. Like, he loves to forgive us. He's, he doesn't hold our sins against us. When we confess, and he's able to forgive. Um, and the last stanza is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we're praying that God protects us from evil and the powers of this age, because those powers are at work here. And, we, and this time of year, we, we fixate kind of on death and skeletons and boogeymen and, and, you know, whatever. Like, Halloween's Halloween. It's whatever. It's not an evil in and of itself. But on some levels, we have a preoccupation with death. We have a preoccupation with, with, uh, with scary stuff. And it's a time of year we kind of pull that stuff out and really kind of either we think deeply on why are we feeling this way or we're, or we're almost entertained by the by the like the potential that we could die. So horror movies are there almost as a way to like, it's the thrill of, oh, you could almost be killed if this crazy guy is behind you with an ax or something. And, and there's a whole cottage industry of people that watch these things. And I'm not making a comment on it. It's just we kind of have this tendency to be fascinated by darkness sometimes. And it, it acknowledges that it's around us, but we can never be fascinated by it. We have to remember that God is beautiful, God is good, and the darkness is a temporary thing that's going to pass. So there are evil powers in this world, but their rule and reign is up because Christ has conquered them through, the, through his death and resurrection. So the kingdom of God is also calling the darkness to come before the light and to be subjected to it. Because the darkness doesn't have to bind God's people anymore. We can be set free. So when our evil powers in the world that influence others, influence ourselves, that honestly cause war, death, and disease, and destruction and stuff, we're agents of agreeing with God, like, Father, let your kingdom come into the world. Let God let the war in Israel and Palestine cease. Like, we're, when we pray those prayers, we're asking God's kingdom to come into that situation. And for the dark powers to kind of stir that stuff like a big pot for them to stop. So the more we do that, the more things on earth do change. Like, there is power in prayer. And there's power to confront darkness. So this time of year, we don't have to be, there's people, I know some Christians that don't go outside their house on Halloween. It's like, the earth is the Lord's, you guys. Like, you don't have to be scared. There's going to be a bunch of little kids in masks that go out there. You know, it's, it's all right. You know, but all that to say, it's like, we have to realize that Christ has overcome. It's Christus victor, meaning Christ is victor. He's conquered death and hell and the grave. And so when we say the Lord's Prayer, we're acknowledging that, Lord, You've overcome those things, and Lord, we don't want to be led in that direction. So lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, because you're ultimately king. You know, there is no other. There's lots of pretenders to say they're king, but they're not God. They're not king. So we, we, we agree with heaven, we agree with the Father, that Lord, it's, that you are the king, you are the ruler of the earth, and this world belongs to you. This is my Father's world. Does that make sense? So, all that to say, in our practical lives, if we're feeling stuck, if we're feeling like we go to, if it's our quiet time, we're going to a time of prayer, and it's like, how do I engage with God? And there's a million things going on in my life. You know, I got to do this today. I got to mow the lawn. I got to go to work. I got to blah, blah, blah. I got to raise the kids, blah, blah, blah. This prayer has everything we need in it to just set ourselves back on the ground, reconnect us with God. And, and just, it opens the door to more of him. Um, before st starting to read the Bible, try saying the Lord's Prayer. You know, get grounded. Read the Bible with him. It's not just information. It's meant for us to encounter God as well. So all that to say, I hope this is encouraging, encouraging to us. We have access to the Father, and we can all go there. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your, your word. Lord, we just ask that you fill us with more and more of your spirit. Father, we ask that you would make us more aware of your presence this week and throughout our days. Father, we ask that you for your kingdom to come and your will to be done in our lives, on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.